Okay, so we should be recording um, now, but as always, if you have any questions at any point, just feel free to shout out. If you don't want to be recorded asking a question, I can post that at any time, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm trying to keep this session to about an hour and uh, really make it worth your time. So I appreciate that you joined. Uh, in preparation to kind of having a good plan in place, uh, what I want to focus and what I want us to spend our time really on is, uh, of course, if you have any questions, that's the priority, but otherwise, things that come up in the quiz uh, for this week's assignments. Uh, assignments. So that's really what, what I'm hoping to uh, focus on. I offer these sessions on Wednesdays, once at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then now the evening session at 8 o'clock. But uh, these are not compulsory. I really appreciate you joining. These sessions are here to help you in any way I can. Um, typically covering if there's anything we didn't get a chance to cover in a class, on our face-to-face -face class, or if you have any particular questions, or if there's nothing like that, then kind of tackling the assignments. Both of the sessions, the morning and evening one, are the same. Uh, of course, the questions might vary a little bit, uh, but whenever it is the exact same, I normally just upload one recording of that. Uh, of course, as always, if you want to have uh, any help to during anything that doesn't get covered, uh, during these sessions, I'm happy to do other times as well, so you just let me know. And uh, like I said, uh, I really want this to be of an assistance for you. So if there's anything in particular, feel free at any point to uh, write to the chat or unmute and shout out or uh, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll just uh, focus on what I think might be the most useful. We had a look of this one uh, during our class. So this week, there's only two things you have to do independently, and that's the quiz, and then there's the practice anatomy. Uh, typically, I think that practice anatomy, really anatomy is just sitting down and getting bogged into it and memorizing structures. So there's very little, I'm more than happy to go through it, but there's very little anything mind-blowing that I can offer to that. So I'm, I'm normally focusing on the quiz material. And then the lab we will continue uh, or we will do tomorrow, and I'm hoping that you can complete it all in a class so you wouldn't have uh, homework. I think I asked this already in a class, uh, if Connect is working out for everyone. If there's any issues with it, you just let me know and we'll get it set up. We completed this handout about the uh, major endocrine organs, and it works as a good kind of a cheat sheet or a quick reference sheet when we get to the exam time, uh, really covering to the level of detail that I'm looking in an exam. The quizzes that we have on weekly, they might go a little beyond that, but uh, I try to make sure that during these Wednesday sessions, uh, I answer to every question, I introduce those, every question that might come up in the quiz. So if there's any questions about anything so far, give me a shout out, otherwise I'll just carry on. So, um, what we're going to go through are, I went through every single question that's in the quiz and I collected, uh, kind of a, trying to put some order and structure into it, and I collected the key points that you might want to review from what we have already talked in a class and anything that we didn't get a chance to cover in a class. So that's where those notes are coming. So uh, we started our class last time by comparing a little bit of the nervous system and then the endocrine system. And what we remember from the nervous system from last time, uh, last semester when you took the Bio 201, was that as it operates through the action potentials, these action potentials are really rapid 
So the actions of the nervous system have to take place very quickly, but they last only a short amount of time. Uh, the only place within the nervous system where we are not relying on action potentials, where there's actually chemicals moving, are our neurotransmitters at the synapses, so the space between the two nerve cells. Um, and those neurotransmitters are target, uh, targeting then specific cells. So they are also kind of a lock and a key mechanism, if you wish. The endocrine system, which is our focus, in comparison to what we see with the nervous system, that's much more slower acting, and the effects of endocrine system are also much more longer lasting. So that's because we are using chemicals that are released from endocrine glands, and they remain in the blood, and they need to travel through the blood, uh, so that takes a little bit more time. Uh, these chemicals act on the surface, cell surface of target cells, or inside the uh, receptors of the target cells, if, if these ones are lipid paste. Uh, another comparison, kind of playing around with the same topic, uh, in terms of if we think of the nervous system again, you can think of the effects of nervous system being very local and specific, whereas the endocrine system, the hormones travel within the bloodstream and they go throughout the entire body. Um, I think that everything else from this slide was already covered earlier on. Um, so that brings us to talk about the hormones. So the workhorse of the endocrine system. So these are various different kinds of chemicals and their transportation takes place within the bloodstream. So that's why next week we are going to move on and talk about the blood. So it kind of nicely makes up this story. And what hormones really are there to do, they are there to trigger or stimulate some sort of a physiological response in the target cell or any other tissue or organ that they're acting on but uh, these are always very specific. Um, hormones, once they have done their job, they get taken up and then removed from the circulation by liver and kidneys. And I'm certain that that was one of the quiz questions. So that might be a useful one. Um, when we talk about the rate of hormone removal, we talk about the metabolic clearance rate. So how quickly these hormones get removed from the body. Uh, the half-life referred to the length of the time that it takes for half of that specific hormone to be removed. And again, both of those terms were asked in the quiz as, um, um, as being able to recognize the definition. The uh, endocrine system contains various different organs, glands, tissues, and cells. So any of those would be a correct answer. And again, I think that on the quiz for this week, there was pick all of those uh, when, when it asks what is endocrine system made of. So that might be a handy, convenient one to remember. We talked in the class about the difference between the endocrine and exocrine glands. And of course, we remember that on this chapter, our focus will be on the hormones. So we are looking at the endocrine glands. And what we notice from those is that they have this rich vascular supply, so rich blood supply to those. So these hormones get taken up to the circulation and then travel to all parts of the body. In comparison, if we look at these exocrine glands, a couple of things that we noticed, they tended to have some sort of a duct. So there's always some sort of a duct that carries the secretions from these glands to a very local area. 
So unlike endocrine glands, where the hormones travel throughout the entire body, exocrine glands act locally. And uh, here I have another comparison, which is built on some of the questions, again, from the quiz. I think that the good comparison we already talked about, the exocrine glands having ducts, how they release the secretions locally. And these secretions can also be things like metabolic wastes or antimicrobial substances. So it doesn't have to always be just say, for example, sweat. Sweat does actually contain some of the metabolic wastes that we want to get rid of as well. Um, endocrine glands are focused for this chapter. So hormone, produce the hormones. These have rich blood supply, travel through the blood vessels to all parts of the body. And there's many different kinds of secretions that the endocrine glands can produce, steroids, monoamides, and peptides. And we didn't have a chance to talk about all of those in great detail during our face-to-face -face class. So towards the end of this session, I'm mentioning a couple of key points to note of all of those. So if it sounds like a new material, fear not, that is because we didn't get into too much of a detail. Remember that, of course, you do have those actual lecture videos that I prepared for you, and on those I discuss it all to the level that I'm expecting you to know. I also had picked up from the quiz this kind of a little comparison or activity which is comparing is it endocrine or is it exocrine uh, secretion. So these would be handy to know. And like I said, I think in the quiz, it actually asks you to kind of drag and drop them to the right area. So um, when we talk about the testosterone, that's secreted by the testes. So that's our sex hormone. And that's, of course, going to be the endocrine gland secretion. Um, the role of testosterone has to do with a twofold function, the production of the, it plays role in the production of the sex cell, so the sperm, but also especially with the secondary sex characteristics that we see. The second one that I have here is sebum, which is secreted, this oily substance secreted either from the skin or hair follicles and provides kind of this lubrication uh, for the skin surface. Uh, helps to keep the inside and outside separate. So that would be an example of exocrine gland, same as the sweat produced by sweat glands. Uh, they are exocrine glands as well. So their function is, again, to protect the skin surface. Sweat is really good in terms of fighting against pathogens, for example. Well, prolactin is something that I hope you remember from our discussion in the class. That was secreted by anterior pituitary gland, and that promoted for the lactation to happen. So definitely an example of endocrine gland secretion. The next two ones that I have here are exocrine glands, from exocrine glands. So mucus is produced in various different mucous membranes that we have throughout our entire body. So nasal cavity, oral cavity, and so on going through the body, uh, really serving a multiple of purposes. And we'll discuss about those as we uh, actually focus on some of the systems where we find these mucous membranes as part of but they are exocrine secretions. Uh, also, an exocrine secretion is bile, and we'll talk about digestive system in great detail later on in this course. And this is why, like I said, that this chapter might feel like a lot, because you don't really have the other part of the story yet. But uh, bile is produced by liver, and it travels to the gallbladder, where it gets concentrated and stored. And bile serves the purpose of digestion of the fats. I would not expect you to know that yet, but that's something that we'll discuss in a greater detail, like I said, once we get to the digestive system. 
But as long as you know that that's an exergrine gland secretion, you're doing really well. Then I have three next ones, which are all endocrine gland secretions. So erythropoietin, which is secreted by kidneys, and to a certain amount also by livers, uh, serves in the purpose of promoting the red blood cell production. Again, you wouldn't know that. We will talk about blood separately next week. And on that, I will refer to erythropoietin, uh, often in uh, literature abbreviated as EPO. So if you see that, don't let that throw you off. Um, that has some nice or interesting side tangents that we can talk about in terms of athletes using EPO as a doping and so on. But as long as at this point you just know that it's an endocrine gland secretion. The tridioterine is a secretion of the thyroid, and it tells that we have three ions there, and that gets converted to T4 as part of the process. Uh, so just as long as you know that that's a secretion from the thyroid gland and has to do with the metabolism. The oxytocin was one that we saw when we talked about the secretions from the posterior pituitary gland that had to do with the birth and lactation. Uh, and again, obviously then being an endocrine gland secretion. The last one, again, we'll talk much more about that when we get to talk about the digestive system. Hydrochloric acid is, is what we do proper scientific name for what we know as stomach acid and secreted by the stomach wall lining. So that's what really fills the bulk of the stomach and helps with getting the uh, digestive processes started, uh, even though very little actual absorption happens in the stomach. But again, a story that we'll look in much greater detail. If at this point you just recognize that that's something that's an exocrine secretion, you're doing well. Um, we kind of touched upon this or played around on this topic uh, as a class activity that how come, because hormones get to travel to all parts of the body, how come all cells don't, then, don't, then don't end up responding to those hormones since they get to everywhere. That had all to do with the fact that we have target cells and only those target cells had receptor proteins for that specific hormone. So that was the key and lock mechanism that we talked a little bit about. So hormones are very specific uh, to specific receptors. And this receptor and hormone needed to be a match, just like, for example, when you've talked on Bio 181 about enzymes. You remember enzymes were these things that helped with create. Uh, chemical reactions to happen, the enzyme and the substrate needed to be a good fit for that to work. Similarly, the receptor and a hormone must be a good fit. And this fit is not just chemical, it is actually also physical fit. Uh, if you want more of an effect of a hormone to happen, there's two things that we can do. And um, we can either end up adding more hormone to the uh, system, and this works as a way of increasing the effect, but it only works as long as there are still receptors that are not occupied. Once all of the receptors are fully occupied, then adding more hormone will not do any good because there's really nowhere for it to go, uh, no receptors to bind to. The other method, how we can increase the effect of hormone, is of course the process of upregulation. And we'll talk about upregulation uh, a little bit more. But upregulation referred to the process that we can add more receptors if we want a greater response to that specific hormone. So that's one of the strategies. So uh, kind of having a look of this, uh, what, what I was just saying, upregulation, this is a slide from our class, upregulation referred to the fact that if we have low amounts of hormones circulating in the body, 
but we want a greater response. One way how we can get a greater response is that we add more receptors on these target cells. So all of that little amount of hormone actually gets to bind, and that way we get a greater response. Downregulation would be an opposite process of this, in which case if we have a lot of hormone going around in the body, and we really don't want that strong of a response, uh, we can just simply remove some of the receptors and that great amount of hormones in the body will have a lesser of an effect because there's less places for it to bind to. Um, another way I kind of try to phrase it in a different way, but really I think the example is a good, good way to tackle this. So let's think of this upregulation where we had a uh, two little hormones going around in the bloodstream. And we want to increase the response to that. Well, in that case, we just added more receptors. Well, a good example of that would be when you're doing resistance training uh, at the gym, your skeletal muscle will actually deploy more testosterone receptors. So the testosterone that's circulating in your body will have a greater effect because now there's more targets for that testosterone to bind, more receptors. Uh, similarly, uh, an example of the downregulation, if you think of individual who would have chronically high insulin levels. So having a high amount of insulin in your body, that would not be great, but there are individuals who have that going on. So one way how we can tackle with that is that, okay, then let's bring down the uh, hormone receptors, their numbers down. So we get decreased sensitivity to that. And uh, I think that I'm just supposed to have an arrow here pointing down. Then kind of also uh, still on this kind of introductory portion of this chapter material, I had these three terms, permissiveness, synergism, and antagonism. And um, these three all are looking at this uh, process that we see on this picture. So we have a hormone, I've named that hormone a hormone A, that does a reaction, and that reaction would be reaction E. But the effects of that hormone can be altered by other hormones. So this is looking at what these other hormones can do. So in permissiveness, this initial hormone also gets an additional hormone present, which then um, helps for the reaction E to occur. That would be an example of permissiveness. I have a much nicer definition of that coming up. So this is just a visual presentation. As in synergism, we have this initial hormone, but when we add also another hormone, in this case it would be the hormone C, the effect will be greater than the effect of hormone A and C added together. So the outcome of that is much stronger than just having these two hormones acting on their own. So that's an example of synergism. And antagonism is when the additional hormone that we add to this process, in this case, I've used the letter D to symbolize that, that blocks the initial hormone, so our hormone A, from making that reaction in the first place. So it works as a way to stop what would happen normally from happening. Let's have a look at these definitions that I think that are a little nicer way of phrasing it. So in permissiveness, one hormone enhances the target organ's response to a second hormone that's secreted at the later time. So that seems like a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, I can understand that that would feel like a lot to, to get your head around. So I hope that the visual description helped. But I do recall that in the quiz, that is the very specific definition they give you. And then they ask, is this an example of permissiveness, synergism, or antagonism? So it's word for word like that in the quiz. 
T2 other definitions. So in synergism, we have two or more hormones that act together, and together they produce an effect that is much greater than the sum of these hormones' separate effects. And antagonism was when one hormone opposed the actions of another hormone. So if they stop this initial hormone from doing what they would normally do. So I hope that those make sense. I know that there's a lot to go through on this. So remember, you do still have a recording available at the end. And if at any point you have questions, you just shout out. The couple of next slides that I prepared are just kind of getting our head around the fact that all systems are connected. I spoke at the first during the first week about the fact that we will approach A and P in a systems approach. So we look one system at the time, whereas in some other approaches, we look at all systems at the same time. So because we're looking at these systems separately, I want to make sure that I highlight that there are connections between these. And uh, these slides I put together based on, again, quiz questions. So they do actually ask about this topic in the quiz as well. So if we have testosterone and growth hormone around, that helps the muscular system to either grow, or if there's a small amount of testosterone and only very small amount of growth hormone around, that would then cause muscles, muscular system to shrink. So we always need to have a right thing adequate amount of testosterone and growth hormone for the muscular system to stay in the state that they are. If there's too much or if there's extra, the muscles grow. If there's too little, the muscles shrink. In terms of the nervous systems, an effect of the nervous system and the endocrine system together, well, we saw that hypothalamus was the master gland. We talked about that. And what hypothalamus does, it really controls the development, maintenance, and functioning of uh, various other structures. So that's where the overlap between the nervous system and the endocrine system comes. If we look at the circulatory system, which is going to be the topic of multiple next lectures or next weeks that we'll have a look of, uh, we'll notice that the circulatory system is really the highways or the transport method that the endocrine system uses. So all of the hormones travel via blood. So that's why it's important uh, to have a connection between these two. If we think of, again, hormones that would relate to the respiratory system, well, two hormones that come to mind are epinephrine and norepinephrine. These both promote the airflow to the respiratory system. So high amounts of epinephrine, high amounts of norepinephrine help with more air getting into the respiratory system. If we try to think of the connections, between the endocrine system and the urinary system. There are multiple hormones that play a role in water balance and electrolyte concentration. So how much body fluids we have and how much solutes do we have in those, uh, those fluids. If we look at the uh, enteric hormones, they play a role in regulation of the gastrointestinal secretions and motility of the gastrointestinal system. So digestive system is largely controlled by this group of enteric hormones. And again, at this point, as long as you make that term sounds familiar at the back of your head, that's all you need to know. We'll cover the digestive system set. Uh, two hormones that are really important as examples of gonadotropins are androgens and estrogens, uh, and they play an important role in the reproductive systems. And then finally here, I have listed for skeletal system, a uh, few hormones again, calcitotriol, parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin. They all are important for regulating the skeletal system, so our bones. Um, 
these are, I think that these are just examples picked out, but those were the examples that come up in the quiz. So that's why I wanted to highlight those. There is another question that's almost similar in the quiz. So this thing gets asked twice. So that's why I'm covering it twice as well. So let's have a look of uh, some of the other systems and other parts of the body and hormones that relate to those. So the hormone insulin helps with turning glucose into triglycerides. And uh, it would be within the adipose tissue where we see the effect of that. So it, within the fat tissues. Parathyroid hormone plays important role for release of calcium for the bone tissues. And growth hormone helps with the growth uh, in general, but also growth in response to any kind of a trauma that one might have for their skeletal muscles. So if there's injury to your big muscles, skeletal muscles that you see, uh, growth hormone amounts would normally uh, rise in response to that, to help to tackle that trauma. We already mentioned erythropoietin, that was the one that got abbreviated as EPO. Uh, that hormone plays role in uh, increasing the production of the red blood cells. So uh, important for, for the blood issues. And red blood cells, of course, play a role in transportation of oxygen, for example. So more are red blood cells, the greater amount of oxygen going to the tissues, greater athletic performance you can do. So erythropoietin is used for that reason as a doping by cell. Uh, in terms of the cardiac tissue, I mentioned that I spent a big chunk of my career working on cardiac field. Uh, one hormone that relates to that is epinephrine. And epinephrine turns the beta receptors of the cardiac tissue to then uh, promote uh, the cyclic AMP and calcium, uh, calcium permeability within the heart tissue. If we have high amounts of growth hormone, that helps the chondroplast amounts to go up and tissue growth to go up in general at the hyaline cartilage. So again, you think of growth hormone that makes something grow more in terms of the hyaline cartilage, it makes that cartilage to grow in greater amounts. We saw in skeletal muscles, it helped to fix those muscles from trauma, to repair them from trauma. Uh, in terms of the pancreas, if one is going through hyperglycemia, then we end up, the pancreas ends up releasing more insulin to again use the homeostatic mechanism to balance off the amounts of what they should be. Epinephrine, uh, again mentioned for the second time, uh, in terms of the sweat glands, that helps with the uh, sweating. So we end up sweating more if there's a great amount of epinephrine around. And finally, uh, if we have a lot of follicle stimulating hormone around, that helps us to produce more either egg cells in case of a female or sperm cells in case of a male. So follicle stimulating hormone really does what it says in the tin. It stimulates the production of follicle uh, you can think of that follicle being an early uh, egg cell in case of a female. In case of a male, uh, promotes the sperm production. I know that these are kind of, again, like snapshots, examples of random hormones, what they do in the body. And we'll get much more into detail in the few next slides to talk more than just examples here and there. Let's look at few in a bit more. Uh, there's a bunch of hormone abbreviations that your quiz will use. And just because we didn't get a chance to really talk too much about these abbreviations, I just wanted to provide them to you uh, on this, this video. So if you are not watching in a live, you can always come back to this, 
this one or if you are watching live, uh, these would be the ones that your quiz uses. So follicle stimulating hormone abbreviated as FSH uh, played role in development of the follicle. Um, ADH stood for antidiuretic hormone. So the function of that was to bring down the amount of urine production. Parathyroid hormone is abbreviated as PTH. Thyroid stimulating hormone as TSH. And then we saw the T3 and T4. These were examples of the, or these were the thyroid hormones. And the number tells just the number of the iodine molecules on each of these molecules how many iodines these molecules contain. Um, I wrote this out on our notes, the prolactin as a hormone. The quiz and the book prefers to use an abbreviation of PRLL for that. And GNRH stood for gonadotropin releasing hormone. The abbreviation ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, quite a mouthful. LH, luteinizing hormone and CRH, cortinotropin releasing part. And just, I'm making a note in case you're wondering that who is attending, so I make sure to give you extra credit for that. So I'm all about extra credit. Any excuse to give that, I always do. So a um, few other abbreviations, few of these are already familiar to us. So let's have a look of each one of these, where the, these are secreted and what they do. So the tyrotropin releasing hormone, which was abbreviated as TRH, is secreted from hypothalamus and um, that played a role in terms of the thyroid, simulating the thyroid, as the name would suggest, and also in terms of the prolactin. From adrenal gland, we get cortisol being secreted in response to adrenocorticotropic hormone. So these are examples of these pathways where one hormone triggers another hormone being produced. Um, luteinizing hormone secreted from the anterior pituitary gland plays role in the release of the egg cell and in general in the sexual development and sexual functions uh, maturing. From posterior pituitary gland, we saw the antidiuretic hormone being secreted and that played role in bringing out the amount of urination. And from anterior pituitary, the prolactin, which played role in the lactation. So again, these are some of the hormones that we've already seen before. Uh, the quiz talks quite a bit about the hypothalamus and pituitary glands. That's because these together are sometimes referred as hypothalamic pituitary gland axis. So they come as a bundle together. So that's why I want to spend a little time talking about them. So you remember hypothalamus, this structure here uh, would be located below the thalamus. And just to orientate ourselves, this would be the anterior side and this would be the posterior side. And I'm going to use the same uh, orientation on all of the slides that we use on this review, just so you can kind of think of which way it would be. So the person would be looking so that the face is facing to the right hand side of the screen. Well, hypothalamus was often described as being a master gland, and that really refers to the fact that hypothalamus controls other glands, other endocrine glands. And there's eight hormones that it secretes. Six of them affect on the anterior pituitary gland, and two of them get stored at the posterior pituitary. And we'll go through them. However, I just want to, before we go through them, show the connection between the hypothalamus and pituitary glands. So pituitary glands, as you remember, were divided into two portions. 
the anterior portion and the posterior portion. And um, there is a connection between the two. On the anterior side, and I'm going to try to find a different N to highlight that. On the anterior side, the connection was through this epundibulum. That's the anat or that's the anatomical connection that we end up finding both on the anterior and posterior side. But if we talk about the physiology, well, uh, the physiological terms that you end up seeing, and these were asked on the quiz. So for the posterior side, we talk about neuroendocrine reflex. That's the connecting tract from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. And on the anterior side, there's not actually a nervous connection between the two. It's simply a vascular connection. So blood vessels that carry the hormones from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. So that vascular connection that connects the anterior portion of pituitary gland to the hypothalamus is known as hypophysial portal system. So portal system tells you that it's a blood vessel system connected. So let's have a look of the hormones and a little bit more detail about these two uh, lobes of the pituitary gland. On the posterior side, like I said, there was a direct nervous connection to the hypothalamus. So we actually are able to find nerves that run from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. This was known, like we just saw, as neurophysis. So they are connect, uh, nerves that connect the two. So posterior pituitary really isn't a true gland as such. It's just a lump of nervous tissue. Um, the other term that you might see when we describe that was the hypothalamohypophysial tract. Again, describing that physiological connection between the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary. The two hormones that we spoke about even in the class, the ADH, which was the antidiuretic hormone. That played role in bringing the urination amounts down and oxytocin as we talked about that. And we talked about the oxytocin in relation to the birth and lactation. Well, let's have a look of the anterior pituitary gland, gland then. I'm gonna try to change the highlighter color. So there is no direct nervous system connection between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. Instead, it's going to be a bunch of blood vessels that connect it. And the name of this connection was hypophysial portal system, like we just discussed. So uh, this is all through hormones that the messages pass to the anterior pituitary gland. And there was a bunch of hormones that I wanted to mention that get secreted from the anterior pituitary. First of all, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. You remember follicle stimulating hormone promo promoted the development of the egg cell or the sperm and luteinizing hormone played role in then the release of the egg cell. And again, this is something that you will become familiar once we talk about the reproductive system in action in greater detail. So at this point, as long as you just recognize those hormones. Thyroid stimulating hormone was another one that was secreted from the anterior pituitary gland, and it travels then to the thyroid and acts there. ACTH is our adrenocorticotropin, uh, which is a hormone also from the anterior pituitary gland. Uh, and we also had prolactin from there. Final one that I wanted to mention from the anterior pituitary was our growth hormone. 
so played role in growth, development, repair, maintenance, all of those. Um, if we have a look of these hypothalamic pituitary hormones, uh, again, a bunch of abbreviations, many of those we are already familiar with, but uh, some that your, your text uh, or your quiz uses, GH was the growth hormone, OT for oxytocin, TRH for tyrotropin releasing hormone, CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and then we had our good friend ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Some of the statins are hormones that you can consider as acting in reverse or opposite to what growth hormones would do. So they inhibit the effects of the growth hormone. We've already seen the follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and ADH, antidiuretic hormone, same as the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, travels to the thyroid and then helps thyroid to work. Well, let's have a look. This is kind of a revision from what we saw before, uh, where these different hormones come from. And this slide is uh, a summary of one of the quiz questions. So the quiz asks you to map that is this hormone done, uh, hormone secreted by the hypothalamus? or is it secreted by the anterior lobe of the pituitary or by the posterior lobe of the pituitary. So that's why I wanted to list them here. So we're just going to have a look through those just to make sure that we can match them all to where they should be. So growth hormone was from the anterior pituitary, same as was our ACTH. So you remember that was our adrenocorticotropic hormone. So both of these from anterior pituitary. The others that are from anterior pituitary, follicle stimulating hormone, and then our thyroid stimulating hormone. They all are from the anterior pituitary gland. So you remember this was the anterior side, this was the posterior side on this diagram above. But let's have a look. I only have two examples for the posterior pituitary hormones that you should recognize, uh, just simply because those were the two ones that the quiz asks. So our oxytocin was secreted from the posterior pituitary, and same was our ADH, antidiuretic hormone. They are both from the posterior pituitary. And the rest are then from our hypothalamus. So the hormones that are secreted from the hypothalamus, those included our thyroid releasing hormone. Oh, I didn't mean to go that way. Thyrotropin releasing hormone our gonadotropin releasing hormone, our gonadotropin corticotropin releasing hormone, and our somatostatins as well. They were all from the hypothalamus. The next one that your quiz does, it asks for us to discuss step by step a few different processes, physiological processes. And one of these was looking at the role of hypothalamus and pituitary glands in terms of, and the hormones that they produce in terms of regulating the body temperature. And the reason why I think that this is a good question, I was pleased to see it on the quiz, is because it's all to do with the homeostasis. So you remember I used this specific diagram to explain the homeostasis in our class. And we can see this diagram applying really well to this process. So if we have a low body temperature, so it's getting too cold, it is the thermoreceptors that detect this. And in response to these thermoreceptors detecting that our body is getting too cold, 
the hypothalamus will start releasing tyrotropin releasing hormone. And this tyrotropin releasing hormone will act on the anterior pituitary gland to increase the secretion of the thyroid stimulating. Thyroid stimulating hormone, of course, acts on the thyroid gland. And now T3 and T4 are secreted, or T3 is actually converted to T4. And as a result of that, our st cells will start acting more, our cells will become more active. And as cells work, they produce as a byproduct this heat that we saw. That was whenever we were converting energy from one form to another. So in this case, this heat that we're producing helps us to bring up the body temperature. So I think that that sounds like a lot, but really what you need to do in the quiz is just to put this in right order. So if you're able to take anything away from this slide, take the order that first it's the thermoreceptors that pick up the drug in the body temperature. Then from the hypothalamus, the thyrotropin releasing hormone is released. That causes the thyroid stimulating hormone to be released from the anterior pituitary gland, which causes the thyroid gland then to release the T3, convert it to T4, and cells become very active. So it's really on the quest just putting these in right off. Uh, another example is how we deal with uh, hydration. So if we are noticing that you're getting dehydrated, we have cells within the hypothalamus that detect that, okay, you're getting dehydrated because the amount of solute in your body is increasing. So we have more of that stuff that should be dissolved into the liquids. So that gets detected and that's a sign that we are dehydrated. Well, as a res response to that, we are generating an action potential that travels from the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus down the axons at this hypothalamic hypophysial tract to the posterior pituitary gland. And now what posterior pituitary gland does, it secretes this hormone that we saw before. And this hormone was the ADH. ADH makes you urinate less. So ADH travels throughout the body until it finds its way to kidneys. And it causes part of the kidney, known as nephron, to start reabsorbing more fluids. Nephrons are a structural and functional unit of the kidneys. They're tiny, tiny, tiny structures. And we will talk about them in great depth when we talk about urinary system. So again, that's why these seem like a really hard concept to grasp because you don't yet have the knowledge about the urinary system. But just if nothing else, take this order of events so you get the full points in the quiz. And remember, you can try the quiz multiple times. You will then, uh, I will only use the best score that you got uh, towards your final grade. Uh, I've listed a couple of uh, processes that related to different uh, endocrine glands. Thymus, you remember, that was to do with the metabolic control thyroid, to do with metabolic control thymus. Uh, T cell maturation, calcium homeostasis, pancreas with glucose regulation, adrenal gland, uh, the fight or flight responses, acute and chronic stress responses, kidneys uh, to do with hydration and blood pressure regulation, and gonads to do with the reproductive system. The other kind of uh, example of homeostasis that the quiz likes us to explore is going to be the how pancreas works in regulating the amount of glucose in the blood. So if we have a high amount of glucose in the blood, it is the cells within pancreas, and these cells are known as beta cells. They detect that and they start releasing insulin. So you remember some people cannot 
produce their own insulin, their beta cells within the pancreas are not producing insulin. So when they are eating something that would cause their, there to be a high amount of glucose in their blood, well, they have to inject insulin for themselves. And this insulin travels to the liver and to a certain extent also to the muscles and fat cells and causes glucose to be taken up. So glucose gets stored to the liver in response to insulin. And as glucose gets taken up to the liver, well, now blood glucose levels go down back to the normal level that they should. So if you have a friend who needs to take insulin type 1 diabetes uh, patient, they take that before they're going to eat a high glucose meal so that they are able to bring down those glucose levels since their body wouldn't do it, no. The opposite of that would be if we have very low levels of glucose in the body. Uh, now our pancreatic alpha cells release glucagon, and what glucagon does at the liver, it causes us to release more glucose. And as we are releasing glucose, to, it causes our blood glucose levels to return back to the normal. So both of these are examples of homeostasis, and you remember especially the negative feedback loop. The negative feedback loop was all about bringing us back to the normal, stopping this change from happening. Uh, in terms of insulin, how is insulin made? Uh, it's this pre-proprio insulin that then gets one peptide removed from it, and that causes this chain that's left. Uh, to fold on itself, and we have three disulfid bridges. This gets packed into secretory vesicles, and the connecting peptides, which are the large middle segments, get, segments get removed, and the remaining part is actually now the insulin that we wanted to produce. Again, the only reason why I added this slide was that this is something that the quiz asks you to just put this in order. That first we have pre proprio insulin, then peptide gets removed, then it gets packed into secretory vesicle. Now the middle segment gets removed and we have insulin. Uh, in terms of the female reproductive system, so we're going to be looking at a luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. This is a handout I give to my students when we study this topic. Uh, in a class. So again, we have not covered this yet, so it might be hard to get a grasp of these hormones, but let's go through it regardless. So when we have a new menstrual cycle, uh, the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin releasing hormone, which travels to the anterior pituitary through the adenohypophysis, an adenohypophyseal portal system, and there in the anterior pituitary gland, this causes for follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone to be released. And we remember that the follicle-stimulating hormone drove the development of the early egg cell, whereas luteinizing hormone then was all to do with the release of the follicle. And once the follicle, which is the egg cell, is released, now the egg cell, the follicle, or what's left of the follicle, really, starts to secrete estrogen and inhibit. And these cause the anterior pituitary gland actions to go down. And now the follicle becomes what's left of the follicle, what didn't become the egg cell, but rather stayed behind. That's the egg cell, but stayed behind. That part is known as corpus luteum, and that starts to secrete progesterone, which function is to maintain the pregnancy. Again, sounds like a lot, but once we get to the uh, reproductive tract, I'll explain this step by step, and it will make more sense. At this point, as long as you can put this in order on your question, you should be super good. A couple of remaining questions in the quiz ask whether something's a steroid or peptide. So uh, I have covered these in our um, 
lecture when we talked about the water soluble hormones and lipos, lipid soluble hormones, we remember that the water soluble hormones could not enter the cell, so they have to act on receptors that are on the plasma membrane, also on the cell membrane. And once they bind to that cell, uh, that receptor of the cell membrane, they trigger a secondary messenger to act inside the cell. Lipid soluble hormones instead, they could enter into the cell so they can go directly to act on a receptor that's located typically within the nucleus, so they activate genes that we need. This is another good table that I've included in our lecture videos, but really if we try to uh, kind of match is, are these examples of steroids or peptides, we see that the steroids, they require a transport protein, uh, they are hydrophobic, they pass through the cell membrane and act directly on, at, on the, at the nucleus, and their response can take hours to days. Whereas peptides, they are hydrophilic, they bind to the membrane receptors, need a second messenger, and they utilize these cyclic AMP, DAG, IP3 uh, processes, and the responses for these are almost immediate. Another question from the quiz uh, asks whether these are examples of steroids, monoamides, or peptides. Testosterone is a steroid. Uh, norepinephrine, thyroid hormone, and dopamine are all examples of monoamides. Uh, estrone is an example of steroids, oxytocin is peptid, cortisol is a steroid, and all adrenocorticotropic hormone, insulin, and glucagon are examples of steroids. Uh, this slide I included because really what the uh, quiz asks you to do is visually as well to match are these steroids, monoamides, or peptides? So testosterone and estradiol are examples of steroids. Uh, epinephrine and tyroxine are monoamides, and peptides are uh, examples of that are insulin and oxytocin. If you look at peptides, are these longer structures? They fold much more, these molecules, whereas steroids are really made of three circular structures and something added to those. Uh, monoamides, something in between. Um, we talked about, or the quiz asks you to know how cholesterol gets converted into various hormones. So cholesterol first gets turned into progesterone, which then can be converted into testosterone, which gives rise to estradiol, or it can be converted, the progesterone can be converted into cortisol or aldosterone. Again, if you just take a snapshot of that, uh, that picture, you should be pretty good. That's a picture that I just edited from your text. Finally, to kind of have a look of wrapping up things, uh, in terms of stress responses, Whenever we talk about stress, and this is a question in the quiz, stress refers to when we have some kind of a situation that upsets your normal homeostasis. So this normal maintenance of consistent internal environment is somehow disrupted. And stress causes a threat to either your physical or emotional well-being. So that would be a definition how we look at stress on light of the endocrine system. And what is the typical stress response? There's two hormones that you want to know as they relate to that. Epinephrine and cortisol levels both go up. And let's have a look of that in a little more detail. So um, what I want to say first is though that physical causes of stress, what can cause you a stress? And this again is a question in the quiz. You want to be able to take all these three because it gives you a list and you choose as many as you wish. So malnutrition, intense exercise, and infection all can cause physical stress for your body. If you're not getting enough food, if you're burning energy in great amounts because you're exercising so much, 
or you have an infection which then causes as well, it could cause stress to your body. So let's have a look of acute stress in comparison to chronic, which is long-standing stress. So in an acute situation, which is short, um, immediate stress kind, uh, that's caused by epinephrine. And what happens, we end up angiotensin secretion increases, glycogen consumption increases, and sodium detention increases. If it's a long-standing stress that lasts for a long time, it's the cortisol, which is an example of glucocorticoids, that causes gluconeogenesis to increase, protein breakdown to increase, your immune system becomes weaker, testosterone and estrogen levels decrease. There's also a question regarding the stress response where they talk about three different uh, steps. So the first step that we see with the stress responses has to do with alarm reaction. So initially, when you're get going through stress, the initial response to the stress, it includes that your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, and your blood glucose levels increase. So all of these fight or flight responses, if you wish. So that's how we deal with stress. We go into this fight or flight state. And two hormones that are initially most important for you to note are epinephrine and antidiuretic hormone. Uh, some of the effects include aldosterone levels and angiotensin levels to incre increasing. But those two hormones remember initial stage of stress response where you're doing this fight or flight response, it's the epinephrine and ADH that are important hormones there. Uh, once the stress has lasted for a while, you will end up noticing that we're running out. We have run out of this glycogen in our body. So we need to find alternative sources for energy. And now we start using our proteins and fats for energy. At this point, stage of resistance, it's the cortisol levels that are really important. Uh, they are high. Uh, how it works is through the corticotropin releasing hormone and aden adrenocorticotropic hormone releasing, aden adrenocorticotropic hormone levels increase. Finally, we will run out of even also of the protein and fats. And now we are burning muscle for energy. And eventually that will lead, lead into our body declining and eventually to death. So if the stress continues, that will be fate. This diagram is simply a screenshot that I took from the quiz. If you want to revise the steps of enzyme amplification, we go from small stimulus through hormone cyclic AMP and protein kinases to activated enzymes and metabolic products which gives us much greater effect than we had initially. A uh, couple of words about prostaglandins. Uh, eicosanoids are lipid compounds that have hormone-like effects. So they are made from fatty acid, uh, arachidonic acid, and they are secretions from paracrines. There's about 20 carbon backbones uh, on these and they are found almost on all tissues. Their function is that they are neuromodulators, so they alter the release or the effect of neurotransmitters in the brain. Couple of clinical examples, and these are, I think, the two or three last slides. So if we talk about that we have, in terms of hormones, hypersecretion, so we're secreting too much of these hormones, what will be the consequences if we're secreting too much epinephrine? Well, high amounts of epinephrine will result in your blood pressure being constantly elevated. If we're secreting too much growth hormone during your adulthood, so after you've gone through your growth spurt, if the growth hormone amounts are still high, 
we end up with a condition that's known as acromelanchy. There's a picture there on the right upper corner that causes the hands and face to keep growing and growing and growing. And it does give these kind of a characteristic uh, features for someone who has too much growth hormone as an adult in their body. If we have high amounts of parathyroid hormone, higher than normal, we end up with blood calcium levels being elevated, high amounts of estrogen in men, that would cause that men can actually start producing breasts in response of too high amounts of estrogen, since they shouldn't have high amounts of estrogen. And if you have high amounts of follicle-stimulating hormone, the number of egg cells that develop at one time is going to be too high. Normally, only one egg cell develops per one menstrual cycle, but if we have high amounts of follicle-stimulating hormone, multiple egg cells will Develop. And we actually use this in IVF when we want to produce multiple egg cells, just so we have some spare ones. So if you end up with twins, triplets, quadlets, so on, that's when either it's usually as a result of IVF treatments or for some other reason, your follicle stimulating hormones have been abnormally high. Let's look at Clinical examples of opposite kind when we have too little of these hormones. If we have too little insulin, your blood glucose levels will be constantly elevated. If you have too little growth hormone as an adult, you will develop dwarfism. Again, a picture there on the upper right-hand corner shows there's some characteristic uh, features that dwarfs end up having. Uh, if you have very low amounts of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, that's associated with infertility. Uh, low amounts of glucagon, your blood glucose levels would be very low constantly, and low amounts of erythropoietin are associated with anemia. You remember erythropoietin, what it did? It was responsible for the production of the red blood cells, so now we have Low, low amounts of red blood cells, so we are anemic because we're not getting enough oxygen being transported to the tissues. That's a condition that I relate to. Uh, I, I have that. So uh, some causes that can cause for you to have hyposecretion, and this is one question in, an, uh, in the quiz. So uh, if you have tumors or le lesions, that is destroyed endocrine glands or these tumors or lesions interfere with the ability of these endocrine glands to receive signals. Or there can be sim simply inadequate stimulation of these glands. All of those would cause hyposecretion. Uh, finally, a couple of examples of hormones that are actually not from an endocrine organ. So we talked about this one in the class. Your fat tissue produces leptin, and leptin played a role in appetite regulation. Uh, interestingly, your intestines also produce another appetite, actually appetite suppressing uh, hormone. This one, this hormone is known as peptide YY. Uh, your bone tissues will produce uh, the play role with the pancreas and adipose tissue responses. Your heart uh, produces natriuretic peptide, which plays role in bringing down your blood pressure. Stomach produces gastrin, which is a hormone that stimulates the production of stomach acids, so hydrochloric acids. And finally, your liver produces the angiotensin and erythropoietin. And those are really all of the questions that you will see in the quiz. I know it's a lot. I would probably use this video, use those slides, use your notes to help you to work through the quiz. Remember, I think you can take three attempts. S score is what counts for the uh, final grade. Like I said, I'm leaving the practice anatomy for you to have a look independently. And just as a reminder that there is tutoring available as well. But really, I think, like I said, endocrine system is the system that students typically find hardest just because there's so much 
of hormones. And we really haven't talked about the other systems where we would see how those hormones act. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm more so happy to answer now, or I will also stay around afterwards. But that's all I have for this session. Um, like I said, I know that that's a lot. Use this video to help you to ace the quiz and get full marks for the quiz. That's that's uh, probably um, the best advice I can say. Uh, don't get too freaked out. Like I said, the endocrine system is the toughest one. Uh, next week we get to something that's much more familiar. We will be looking at blood and that's something where we can see concrete. Do we have any questions? Is there anything I can help with? If not, I'm just going to wish you good night. I really thank you for joining. I did take a note that you two were here, so I will definitely uh, take that into account, give you some extra credit as soon as the first chance comes. So uh, I appreciate you joining me, and I'll see you tomorrow for our first lab. Have a good night. And I'm also going to stop the recording here. This recording will be made available for you uh, later on if you want to come back to it and have a look what we just discussed.